when I went to Newcastle, which was in 1969, um, I started off in a hotel bedroom in one of the hotels in Newcastle because the PTE was not formally set up when I arrived. The job that I had as the new Director General was to take over three bus companies, Sunderland, South Shields and Newcastle, to enter operating and financial agreements with the other providers, the then National Bus Company and British Railways, and produce a policy statement and a plan for the future. At the same time, predating me, Tyne and Weir authorities under the chairmanship, as it happened, of Lord Matthew Ridley, who was then the chairman of Northumberland County Council, no relation, uh, had employed Alan M. Voorhees, who subsequently became Martin and Voorhees, and Colin Buchanan and Partners to produce a land use transportation study. They recommended that there should be a new investment in public transport. And Brian Martin, who became the Martin of Martin and Voorhees and at that stage had taken over as managing director of Alan M. Voorhees, because he was a personal friend, when he and some of his colleagues came up from London to review where the project had got to to present to the the authorities the following week, came back on some Saturday afternoon at about 5.30. I gave him a whiskey, sat him down and said, right, what are you going to recommend? And he said, well, we've decided that what the central issue should be is to modernise the rail system and take out, take the clapped out North Tyne Loop, because British Railways are running really grotty old diesels. Take the clapped out North Tyne Loop, take the South Shields line, use the geography of the area to tunnel under Newcastle and Sunderland and a bridge over the Tyne, because without that geography it wouldn't work. Well, I listened to this gobsmacked, and I said, "Ah, oh, it's crazy. You'll never get away with that. I really did say that. Yeah. Um, at the same time, the then chief engineer of Newcastle City Council who was the chairman of the technical committee, didn't give a damn about what the public transport element of the plan was, as long as all of his motorways, which were then part of a massive plan, and as you know, only one had ever been built. As long as these motorways went in, anything could go in as far as public transport was concerned. The irony, of course, is that not another 12 inches of motorway was ever built in the time that Weir Metro was built. You asked about why Newcastle compared with Manchester or wherever. The PTEs were set up as a result of a white paper produced by Barbara Castle, the then Minister of Transport. The white paper was written in 1968, and it said something like, we need new men with new vision in these these posts. And urban areas need a dramatic development of their public transport. And hinted that new lines, new railways, new something might be on the agenda. Now, Manchester whose Director General coincidentally was appointed there on exactly the same day that I was appointed in Newcastle. He'd been the town clerk of Bolton. 
they'd been going bef well before the PTE with a plan. Originally, there'd been a thought of a monorail system, but then eventually they got to the stage of proposing what was called the Pickvick Tunnel, a, a substantial, expensive link through the middle of Manchester linking the two main stations. Well, we got this plan from the consultants, and it had, was blessed by the Tyne and Weir Transportation Study Steering Group. And we then did some more detailed feasibility studies to demonstrate that what the consultants had proposed would work in every detail. We were attacked by one small group of people who, I forget what their name is, but they believe in converting railways into roads. And this group said, it's a complete waste of time to have this new metro scheme. Um, at any rate, we did, we did all the analysis. And the, the, the thing that we achieved rather magnificently, we actually took the whole scheme from a line on a map to digging the first tunnels in a three-year period, which I can't, I don't know what the history is before us, but you couldn't do that today. The whole process is very, very much longer. And David Howard was the director of planning, and he had a very small team who worked magnificently and put together the whole plan with the help of the consultants now called Mott MacDonald. They were Mott, Hay and Anderson in those days and a firm of uh, electrical and mechanical consultants. With the North Tyne Loop, the link to South Shields, but nothing at that stage to Sunderland. We were going for what we thought we could manage to do. And I spearheaded the obtaining of the finance and the parliamentary bill. In those days, the finance, financial arrangements were such that for a scheme like a new rail system, tram system or whatever, um, was funded, 70, if you got funding, you got 75% of the cost was given by the government and 25% of the cost was paid by the local authorities. Now, there is a, also the question of why did we go for the technology went for, we went for. The original concept was a tram, albeit on major new infrastructure in tunnels and bridge across the time. And we were looking for a name for this thing because we did not want it to seem like a train. Light rail was had not become fashionable term in those days, so we called it super tram. And that was the thing when I was on television and in in uh, in the press, it was all super tram for, for Newcastle, for Tyne. Well, for Tyne side, it wasn't Tyne and Weir. And remember, Sunderland was my hometown, and it wasn't going to Sunderland. There's another story about Sunderland which I'll tell you about. Well, that's how it all came about. And Oh, well, no, what I, no, what I should say is, because we went so quickly with putting the whole scheme together, getting the money and getting the parliamentary powers. We were ahead of Manchester. We got the money and then, as happens always, financial crisis, no more money for major new schemes and Manchester had to wait another 20 years. We got a slug of money because it, it was the first new urban railway in Britain other than extensions of London Underground for Years and years and years. Once people had seen us do it, a lot of cities thought we'd like some of that. And all of a sudden, 
even if there was money, the government had more schemes to look at than, than they could cope with. When we went for our money, we were the only project. It was Newcastle or nothing. The, the government knew that Manchester was coming behind, but they'd not actually submitted their proposals. Now, the other thing that happened was our relations with British Railways, including friends of mine. Because, clearly, the British Railways people, who had been providing this clapped-out diesel service for years and years, didn't take the Tyne and Weir transportation study seriously. And they also didn't take seriously the small band of schoolboys who, as they saw us, who were developing this system. And they sort of did nothing about it. Gradually, they began to notice that we were taking things seriously and were, were putting forward a serious project so they started to put forward the British Railways alternative to it, of how they would modernise the whole scheme. Well, things came to a head when John Payton, the then Tory minister, came up to visit Newcastle. We'd already been working with the economists, the senior civil servants. We had lobbies of... Tory and Labour people from the North East all pressing this scheme down in Parliament. So that was all moving ahead. But the Minister had never lived, visited Newcastle. And um, Peyton, who came from Somerset, opposite end of the country, came and he was asked whether he was going to approve our scheme by the press, because he met the press after he'd met the authority and, and we'd been for a bit of a tour around. He, he gave a guarded response, but it was not a negative by any means. At any rate, eventually, shortly after the visit, it was announced on a Friday, I think it was, that we were going to get the money so the scheme was going ahead. And the British Railways people had their proposal ready to put on the desk of their chairman on the Monday morning, and they were too late. Too late yeah, it's about weekend. Now, I'm not saying their scheme would have gone ahead, but it, it was ironic that we picked the thing up, ran with it, got it before people noticed. Well, there was Tony Ridley, there was David Howard, John Baggs, Simon Coventry, young lads. It was a very small team we had. Um, Andy Cunningham, first chairman, an absolute character, splendid chairman. I know he got into trouble, but he was a bloody good chairman because he appointed me, of course. But And he never said this, but essentially his message was, now look, Sonny, I'll take care of the politics. You get on with the professional side. And he gave us enormous latitude as long as what we did was efficient and convincing. And he took care of the politics because, you remember, I went from a research job at the age of 35 into this prominent position. And I would have been chewed up and spat out by the political process without a very strong chairman. Mm. Bill Collins was uh, str uh, very influential. Bol, uh, Bill was the leader of Gateshead Council. Um, and he was very keen on various transport policies. He had a lot to do with the zero fares for pensioners and that sort of thing. Arthur Gray was a character at the time, but he was not in a position of, of, of power. He was part of the authority, and he'd been a very tough and powerful uh, Tory. But, but it, it, had, it had to be Andy. had to be Andy. And I don't think... I, because Andy got into trouble, 
later. I don't think Andy ever got the credit he deserved, the political credit that he deserved. And remember, he came from County Durham, and therefore people were suspicious of him on those grounds. <laughs> I trust they weren't suspicious of me because I came from Sunderland. And I, I, once asked, I once asked Bill Collins, how on earth did you take the risk with me? He said it was very simple. He said, we were offering the job. You were the only candidate who knew, knew more, more about what the job was about than anybody else did. And they, they liked the fact they'd brought someone home from London to... Yeah. But the, the, the coming home bit was important to them. It was just nice to think that they could find someone who'd been born and brought up in the area. Not that that gave me more talent, but given that I had whatever talents I had, that was a plus that I'd been born and brought up in. The, in. There's always been battles between Wearside and Tyneside. And the Wearsiders were not particularly sympathetic to the power of the Passenger Transport Authority. For, as part of our project, we developed a test track for the new rolling stock. And we intended to use a disused piece of re British Railways track running through part of Sunderland. And I went with David Howard and others to a public meeting at one, what was then Sunderland Tech, now Sunderland University, not on the site that it is today, to make this proposal and consult the public. Well, they yelled at us for two and a half hours, non-stop. And the next morning, David and I said, forget it, we'll go to Long Benton. That's why the test track was at Long Benton. And indeed, I've got another very interesting photograph of, because of, you know I went from Newcastle to Hong Kong, the rolling stock for Hong Kong was tested on the Long Ben test track. So I've got a photograph of Hong Kong, the first Hong Kong train in snow on the test track in Long Ben. So the Sunderland people sort of w cut themselves out, out of any major issue. But basically, we did what we could to get the whole project going. The other thing that we did, which helped us to get approval... If we'd looked at the the metro, I, I, I can't remember at what stage we christened it metro, because it was super tram for a long time. The design was getting rather heavier, so it's not exactly a light rail scheme today. It's a lightweight conventional train with certain developments, but it, it's, not, it's not a light rail scheme. And of course, it, it it runs completely on a on a on its own track. It doesn't run through the street as as light rail projects do. The other thing we did was to make sure that our analysis included a totally integrated system. And the sums were very much better if we took into account the supporting bus network with the bus network reorganized to support the metro with some of the routes that were paralleling the system being used as feeder services. And, and that's why we said it was the best integrated transport system in the United Kingdom, because it was designed that way. And that helped to commend it to the economists and the civil servants with whom we were negotiating when we were developing the scheme. There was general spirit of support in, in the Northeast because, I mean, my view of politicians, it, it's, it's a long time ago, but my view of politicians then was that, although they used to fight like cats and dogs, if it was getting something out of London or getting one over on London, they were, the, the, the Geordie politicians were absolutely united, it didn't matter which party they came from, it's the North East versus London. In in um, in uh, in London, remember that the whole thing had been started by Barbara Castle, 
the Tories had taken over, but the spirit of let's do something in the urban areas, the whole ethos of setting up the passenger transport authorities and executive was very strong. Uh, we were wise enough to recognize that when you're trying to sell a scheme like this, you're not going into government at one level. You're going in at three levels. You're going in talking to the economists in detail. You're going in talking to senior civil servants who have to advise ministers. And you're going in talking to politicians supported by your own politicians. And we had a very good public relations man called Tom Bergman, Czechoslovak Jew, wonderful man. I mean, he had an extraordinary history because he'd been a refugee from Prague twice in his lifetime. I always thought to be a refugee once in your life is bad enough. And he was a refugee from the Nazis, then he was a refugee from the Russians. And he'd lived in, in, in the Northeast for a long time. Um, and I remember that when we got the scheme going, I decided we'd, we'd, we'd inform, inform the public. So I called in three different firms of PR people and said, I want 10,000 leaflets putting through people's doors and running a campaign to get them on side. And the first two told me how they'd do it. And then Tom comes in. He said, that's bloody rubbish. I said, I beg your pardon. He said, that's no way to go about it. Let me tell you what we're going to do. And he outlined a political campaign. And that's the political campaign we ran, working very closely in the Northeast with the politicians, working very closely with the politicians in the House, working very closely briefing ministers. So the ethos in the minds of the civil servants was arising from Barbara Castle was there. So there was general support. The question they had to ask themselves is not, is this a crazy idea? But can these guys do it? I mean, what was their track record? No track record, because... A bunch I, of schoolboys, according to... A bunch of schoolboys, yeah. And remember, my, I was 35. My job had been head of research in the Highways and Transportation Department in the Greater London Council. So here I am, wanting to build a railway, negotiating with the unions. So that was the issue, in my opinion, they had to ask, the, can we trust these guys to, 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 deli to deliver? We generally got a fair win because we were doing something new and different and positive. Like everybody in public transport, we still got criticized for the the bus services, you know, the old thing about the banana route through Jesmond and buses come in bunches, ho, ho, ho. I, I have a recollection of getting a letter from an elderly lady, because uh, I was Dr. Ridley in those days, not Professor Ridley, of course. And she wrote to me and filled three pages saying how bloody awful the bus services were. And her last paragraph said, and by the way, I'd like to know what you're a doctor of. You're certainly not a doctor of running buses. <laughs> so we used to get that sort of thing, and therefore mistrust. But generally, it's just the Geordies like to get behind something that's good and new and leading the country, because we were leading the country. I, I tell you that one of my jobs that I got when I, when I started was to reach operating and financial agreements with the National Bus Company, but also with, with British Railways. And we were paying a lot of money in subsidy for British Railways to provide a third-rate service with clapped-out diesels. And I, I, don't, I can't recall how much I thought this through in some subtle way, or whether it just developed... But the line I took with the public, with the press, with the Passenger Transport Authority was consistent. There's three things you can do. You can pursue the recommendation for a metro coming out of the transportation study. 
you can continue on as we are, or you can close down what's there. I'm not having anything to do with continuing as, as you are. You either do it or you shut it down. There's no, limping on the way we've done all these years is no good. Now, some people might have regarded that as a threat, but I genuinely believed that, 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 that those were the options. Mm. Simply to go on as we were going was just hopeless. It was a sort of, you know, shit or bust alternative yes. and because people were and the, and the other thing you've got to remember people in the northeast like to have something to be proud about and I won't say every citizen was on side but a lot of people thought wow you know here's here's what we can do and we worked on that frame of mind very strongly um, another thing that exercised people's minds at, the, at that time was unemployment. And anything that enhanced people's ability to travel around the region was well regarded, although we were tending to put on additional bus services from areas of low, en low employment into Washington New Town, for example. That's, and I don't think we saw the metro particularly as tackling that issue. The other thing that it did, on the, I don't think we actually were cute enough to think this through, the metro centre in West Gateshead was just opening. I don't think people saw it clearly, but if N Newcastle had not improved its transport accessibility, the centre of Newcastle could very easily have declined. And I personally believe, I've got no statistics to demonstrate it, that the metro was, was the, was, was the saviour of Newcastle as a city centre. Yes. I mean, there are many problems still, but without it, it would have been almost impossible to, to develop a dynamic city centre. Um, you asked did we, if we get, got wholehearted support. We didn't get support. Well, first of all, we squeezed past British Railways. They weren't supporting us, and then they got stuck with us. In fact, I once went to a conference where Bob Reed the First was in the chair, and he'd been one of those. He wasn't the chairman of British Railways in those time at that time, and he was a very fine railwayman, Bob. He was one of the few chairmen who'd sort of come up from within the organisation and understood it. In fact, if he'd had the sort of money that's being spent on the railways today, he'd have, he'd have done a magnificent job. Um, but he acknowledged that he'd opposed the Tyne and Weir Metro. He acknowledged from the podium and that he was wrong, which was quite generous of him, I thought. But the people who would were opposed were Northern and United, part of the National Bus Company, because they were go-go bus men, very good bus men, but they didn't like that they were A, beholden to us because they had to provide the services we were willing to pay for because we had the powers. And secondly, they didn't like the thought that we not only were changing the routes of our Newcastle buses and South Shields buses, we were changing the routes of the Northern and United we were telling them what buses they should run. Now, when the Tories came back in, I don't think they were basically opposed to an integrated system. They just wanted a system whereby privatised buses had the freedom to make their own decisions. And inevitably, that meant that buses would not be directed in the manner that best suited the integrated system. So I don't, think that, I don't think the Tories wished to destroy the system. It's just that their political objective um, outweighed any other consideration in their mind. One further point. We did a great job, but it's a gross generalisation. 
But I would say, when things go well, in my experience, it's about 50% competence and 50% luck. You can't do it without competence. But you sure as hell can't do it without luck. And we were fortunate, first of all, with the timing relative to Manchester. There was a two-year window. If we tried to go for a scheme like this before the time was right, it wouldn't have moved. If we'd missed the window when the money was available, it would have been too late. So we were fortunate. And although we created it, I think what we really did was we didn't create the opportunity. We snatched the opportunity. Um, the other fortunate thing was the juxtaposition of a transportation study that was being carried out. And there was a happy coincidence because our job required us pr to produce a plan. The transportation study needed someone to implement it. So the happy juxtaposition was a bunch of guys called the passenger transport executive looking for a plan to implement and a transportation study producing a proposal looking for someone to implement it. And those two things just came together wonderfully. Now, I don't think we could have sat down and thought that thought it through and made it happen. It, it was, again, grasping the opportunity. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome.